welcome to Ask the Expert. This is our uh, pop-up digital cafe where we have a short um, sharing of slides and then just a really hopefully robust discussion about what's going on with different scientists. And everyone I think on the call knows that uh, Dr. Jeffrey Bluestone is one of the leading immunologists in the field of T-cell activation and immune tolerance research that's led to the development of multiple immunotherapies, including the very first FDA approved drug targeted uh, T-cell co-stimulation to treat autoimmune disease and organ transplantation and the very first CTLA-4 antagonist drugs approved for the treatment of metastatic melanoma. So he's a huge leader on the stage of type one diabetes um, research and, um, oops, sorry, I'm gonna admit somebody. He's also served um, as the executive vice chancellor and provost emeritus at UCSF and was the former director of UCSF Diabetes Center. And now he is heading up and starting this brand new venture at Sonoma Bio. And we're really excited to hear what's going on and, and how, how it's going and have people um, ask questions. So welcome, thanks again. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'll start off by admitting I did not prepare any slides. I didn't uh, know that, but I'm always good at answering questions. So hopefully- Okay, yeah, that's fine too. <laughs> it's focused on that. Um, Maybe at least uh, I'll start out by giving an introduction, uh, at least to Sonoma Bio and, and what we're trying to accomplish. Um, Perfect. And a lot of that, of course, is built on my academic career over the past uh, many decades, um, but I think uh, really reflects where we are now in the space of immune tolerance and how to actually achieve a durable and long lasting treatment for patients with autoimmune disease, including type one diabetes, and the idea that um, we can take advantage of uh, the immune system's own um, his, uh, 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 ancient efforts to try to maintain um, an, immuno, an immune homeostasis um, so that we live a balanced life, uh, recognizing foreign uh, agents when we need to, viruses, bacteria, but yet not um, but not attack our own body uh, inadvertently. And uh, I think what we have, we have learned um, over, over the last few decades is that really the immune system is filled with a bunch of uh, checks and balances um, that really allow us that ability to respond um, rapidly and effectively against foreign uh, invaders. Um, and for the most part, be able to control those responses um, and, and balance those responses so that we don't get uh, undue um, overly active immunity. Now, one thing we've learned the last two years is that um, that 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 coronavirus and COVID nineteen have taught us a lot yeah. about how that yin yang can really um, backfire. So most of the people who die um, of COVID die of a dysregulated immune response. Uh, they don't die from the virus, and uh, the immune system actually does a great job of responding to that virus. It just get so zealous in doing it that it starts destroying tissues in the lung and, and you end up. So, so it really is an, ex, is an experience that we've now had, which tells us how important this control is. So what have we learned that I think is relevant in this regard? Well, I think what we've learned is, is that a combination of cells and different specialized cell subsets in the immune system and specific proteins that are expressed on those cell subsets have been the way that we have that check and balance system going. In the case of the cells, uh, obviously the effector cells, those cells that target um, the, the foreign viruses and, and cancers and bacteria, those cells um, themselves have to be controlled and do that through a series of what we now call checkpoints which are um, our selective molecules on the surface of those cells that are designed uh, to shut down or to quiesce um, those responses, molecules like CTLA-4 uh, and PD-1. So when you get a good active response, which depends on recognition of antigen, activation, then what we call co-stimulation and cytokine expansion, that bolus of positives then can get um, offset by these breaks um, that are put on the cells. But in addition, what, we, what we've come to appreciate is that there are also specialized cells in the immune system that's, uh, that are designed to keep the immune system balanced and in check as well. And the cell population that, um, that, that many of us on this call and that I, I've been working on for a long time now, these so-called regulatory T cells, Tregs, 
um, are really designed for just that purpose. They survey the, the body, they, there's sentinels running around, and when they see immune systems that have um, been overzealous and out of control, they have a series of activities, uh, almost a polypharmaceutical factory <laughs> that are designed to shut down um, these, and, and, and it really does require all, all hands on deck. It uses um, growth factor modulators, it uses me metabolic modulators, it produces regulatory cytokines, and the cells also will directly shut down antigen presentation, all designed to keep um, uh, the immune system um, in check and, and not overzealous. Now, unfortunately, uh, in autoimmune disease, those two systems, the effector cells and these regulatory processes uh, often go, go awry. And they go awry in part because of the genetics of the person and in part because of the environmental exposures that they've had. And so the effector cells are not easily shut down by these, these checkpoints and, and other cell types. And the, and the uh, regulatory cells aren't as effective as they might otherwise be. So I think that um, all this has led many in the field and ourselves included to think if we can help the system out, if we can help to rebalance that system that we might be able to initially shut down ongoing and autoimmunity, um, and, but maybe even eventually um, to get in early enough to prevent a lot of the damage that it causes. And so the approach of Sonoma Bio has been to take advantage of both sides of this um, balancing act. On the one hand, um, we're developing a biologic that will actively sel and selectively uh, eliminate um, a, 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 a number of effector cells that are responsible for destruction of the tissue. Uh, in diabetes, these are islet antigen specific, um, beta cell specific cells, and do that in a way that allows us to condition or debulk the patient to make them more able to control this immune response by eliminating a lot of the armory that's there to destroy that tissue. And then the second part of the company is the developing cell therapies and particularly Treg cell therapies that can be targeted to tissues that are um, at risk of being destroyed um, and provide through that the ability of these cells to shut down locally the inflammation that's um, out of control and thus avoid systemic uh, immunosuppression and avoid um, the, uh, the targeted effector cells uh, in that tissue themselves. And the way we do this um, is not unheard of, is in fact a, now a very successful approach that's being taken in cancer, which is to provide on these cells a receptor that allows them to recognize an antigen that's present within the tissue that's being attacked. So there are two ways to do that. One is to use a T cell receptor itself, which recognizes antigen. And the other is to use this uh, synthetic biology approach, um, which is a chimeric antigen receptor, which is a fusion between an external um, entity, a monoclonal antibody that recognizes a protein and the internal signaling domains that will drive those regulatory T cells to function. And by putting these cars on these cells, they get to the site, they recognize antigen, they deliver a signal, and hopefully they'll suppress locally. So uh, what we're trying to do is not um, unheard of uh, in this space, but it's really exciting that there are now six or seven companies that are uh, actively involved in this and really does suggest that um, we're gonna give this a good shot um, and see if this, if we, if this combination of the of the T effector depleting agent with the effector cell suppressors, the Tregs, will lead to a durable response. And the nice thing about cell therapy is it's a living drug. And so, as a living drug, the idea is is once you've uh, put this into the patient, those cells will proliferate, they'll survive long term, and um, and allow for a one and done treatment that we won't have to continually um, continually inject like every day um, these cells into into somebody. Yeah. And then I'll end yeah. I'll end with one last point and that is just that um, these are high risk and, and high reward studies. I think we're at the earliest days of this and some of the people on this uh, on this video have really provided a lot of the fundamental research that's allowed us to really get as far as we can and 
and the work that's been supported, especially in the diabetes field, has really allowed us and others to really pursue this aggressively given the, um, the challenges that are ahead for any cell therapy um, program. I feel like um, our field has benefited enormously from the kind of research that's been done uh, in academia and supported often by, by philanthropy. So why don't I stop there? No, oh, that's great. That's a, that's a great, um, you know, high level view. It's awesome that you guys have um, entered the fray here with all your knowledge and background and your experience in the field. I think it's bodes very well for, you know, getting something um, to clinic. So um, I did want to just, you know, sort of give a shout out. Vertex had a big day yesterday, right? And they've showcased that they had um, success in a patient with an implant. And um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about therapeutic windows. So it looks like, you know, obviously this could, your therapy, the TREG therapy you're developing could be really effective in a early therapeutic window prior to diagnosis, like in the prodrome, but also what about its role in, you know, um, you know, in patients that are undergoing uh, uh, like a vertex implant? I yeah, well, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's something to think about. Um, I should say that there's a clinical trial now being conducted at UCSF um, using Tregs in uh, islet transplant setting, working with James Shapiro up in Edmonton. And uh, you, you, the concept is exactly what you said, which is can we um, help to avoid any immune response that might be generated against those foreign islets? Now, remember that the approach that SEMA and now Vertex has taken is to try to create a immune um, cloaked or an immune um, hidden um, cell yeah. so that the immune system doesn't play an important role. Um, but just in that, case. That Leo, I know Leo, <laughs> Leo and, 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 and a lot of people who live around me uh, know my, 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 my thought about that is the immune system is incredible. It's, it can detect a single amino acid difference in a singular protein. So my sense is, is that you can run, you know, but you can't hide. And <laughs> I, I think we could well end up with a cell that is far less immunogenic, which I think would be great, but it may well not be, especially in patients that are pre-sensitized, which are diabetic patients already have a strong and immune response. I think it may be hard to develop a totally immunologically um, inert uh, cells. So I think there is a role for active immune regulation in that context. I think it was one exciting area work that was started in my group by Linda Vo, and there are other people working on this, which is to try to develop um, Tregs out of iPS cells and thinking that you might be able to use the same iPS cell to create the beta cell and create the islets so that you have a matched um, regulatory population to go in. You know, when you look in the future, you can imagine a scenario where even under the best circumstances, off-the-shelf beta cells won't be perfect. And by including um, regulatory cells or some other tolerogenic uh, combo therapy could be quite effective. Yeah, no, it seems like there's a lot of room to move around. I see that uh, representative from Gentibio is here. So that's cool, too, that we have other people that are in um, going after it in the industrial space. And um, I also just wanted to give a shout out to, uh, you know, Marcus uh, Kleinwitfeld. I'm sorry about my pronunciation. He's here from Gent, Belgium, and also um, Yasmin Oseni from King's College London and now Quell. They both have some really interesting papers recently, uh, Marcus in August, with the fast and efficient editing of human FOXP3 Tregs. He set the stage saying fat, robust and fast protocols for genome editing of the Tregs are limited. His group has improved upon this, as shown through the paper. Um, and then um, Yasmin came out in July with her paper, Chimeric Antigen Receptor Modified Human uh, Tregs that constitutionally uh, express IL-10 and they maintain their phenotype and they're potentially suppressive. So both of these um, scientists are kind of wading into refining protocols, I think. Um, how do you how how do you envision that as academia and industry can move together in this whole refining of protocol space, or is it possible? What what are your thoughts? Well, you know, I I my career has all been about collaboration and building teams and creating value uh, in working together. So I would love to believe that uh, the same thing will hold up here. I mean, Doug Melton. You use the example of SEMA. That was work that came out of his academic group that he started SEMA and 
you know, that's been a great partnership now with with Vertex. I think that the King, the King's College folks who I know very well are good friends of mine and people have trained with me. I think they're, you know, will be exceptionally uh, committed to working across the King's College and Quell um, um, space. So I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity for collaboration. I think what's been um, what's what's been missing uh, historically is this um, sense of value, the value proposition on both sides of that fence. Yeah. Uh, I used to show a slide where you would see it was you know pharmaceutical companies throwing a bunch of money over the fence and then the academia is throwing science and nature papers the other way. Um, I think it's productive, but I don't think it really creates the value proposition that can be created now because you've got in companies incredible investment in technology, yeah. uh, often far exceeding what an individual um, academic lab can do so that the ideas that academic labs come into can be executed now in ways that they could never be executed before, given the investments that companies have in technology. So it's more than the money. It's now the technology and the smarts. I mean, the industry has a lot of really smart people, many of which have come from academia, academia myself excluded, but there are some really <laughs> smart people. In my company of the 70 or so employees now, I think we're about a third, a third, and a third academia, um, small biotech, and pharmaceutical um, um, folks. And it's been amazing to watch them around the table talk about that. So given this new way to think about how do you do collaborative science in a more um, coherent and cohesive way, uh, I think we can build on the successes we've had already in a much faster way going forward. I think also that it's important to realize that each of us have our limitations. Um, the ideas that academic scientists can think through and create are unparalleled. I mean, the basic science is essential. We're only at the very um, end of the beginning here and the basic science is essential. So planning, how do we integrate those things? It's not, uh, we're not done, we're just starting. But I think also the value, the proposition of industry really is greater than, than the finances. And so as we, um, as we start building these collaborations, hopefully we'll, will be even more efficient and effective than we were previously. Yeah, well, the finance can, you know, help, you know, bring the best tools to bear and, 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 and get some of the best minds, you know, together. And it's, it's an incentive. So I think that there's a lot to be said about it as a facilitator to drive, um, to really drive. Yeah, no one's turning down the money as far as I can tell. <laughs> Which is fine. I think scientists should be uh, rewarded for their uh, for their their long hours and and uh, deep thinking. Is there anyone else who'd like to talk uh, to unmute themselves and ask some questions? This is the time. Wow, crickets! Really? Come on, somebody. Well, I guess I have a quick question, if I can. Sorry, did I jump ahead of you? No. Uh, we very quick. It's just so this two pronged approach to biologics and T Rex. Would we give them at the same time or only give the T Rex after there's been some debulking already? I, I'm just curious in a maybe very general sense. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be said for sequential treatment, um, both in terms of how do you make sure that you have both a safety profile and you have a um, efficacy profile for each one individually. So you can imagine if you treat one with one, you get the information about that before the other. Um, but I do think that there's a scientific reason for it as well. Um, what you don't wanna do is to have prolonged treatment, unless you can create an incredibly specific debulking agent, like a, an antigen, a peptide specific um, T cell, depleter, um, then you want to avoid long-term treatment with a, a drug that could eliminate uh, cells. So I think short-term debulking, come back in, 
you know, there's some good publications, um, both in transplant by Kishi Tong uh, and in diabetes by a group in Florida, showing that a short-term treatment uh, to debulk can lead to a very increased effectiveness of your antigen-specific T-Rex. And that's the sort of approach of prevention bio right now. They're coming in with the vaccination and then they're coming in with their protocol following it. You know, they're sort of like, you know, just sort of coming in and, and delivering, delivering the, uh, the medication or the cell, whatever it is in very short windows. So, so yeah, it sounds like that might be the, the way of the future. I think, um, I think Lucy Walker was trying to say something earlier. Yes. Um, so along the similar lines, actually, I was thinking about the debulking approach and I was wondering about how age plays into that, you know, how you would consider that in, in younger children, given, you know, additional thymic activity and also um, thoughts around the lymphopenia that, that you generate. Um, you know, maybe you could just talk a little bit more about those areas. Yeah, without getting into a lot of depth into our program, I, I can speak to teplizumab, uh, the anti-CD3 program, uh, that prevention. And if you look at that data, first of all, um, had no problem going into kids. I mean, obviously, prospect of benefits important and safety, and that's prime. But you can get into kids with some of these depleting um, drugs. Um, but also, what's been, uh, I think, important to realize in in the teplizumab work over the last 34 years is that there's never been any evidence of, of real increases in infection. There's been zero evidence of cancer. Um, and the cells repopulate really quite rapidly in the peripheral blood. And my guess is that they actually don't get as depleted in the tissue as we did some studies with OKT3 back in the early 80s, that, that the amount of, of depletion in the tissues is even less than in the peripheral blood. So I think that this debulking idea, this is not lethal radiation and a bone marrow transplant. This is a short-term acute um, loss of effector cells, um, a subsets of effector cells in some cases um, that, 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 the, that, that doesn't impact on immune responses. And so I have very little concerns about the safety and, but obviously if you're gonna go into children, you wanna make sure that you have a good safety profile. I, I have a question. This is Young. I used hey, to. Young. Hi. Uh, I have a question about antigen uh, specific issues. Uh, so, like the successful example, examples, anti CD3, IO2, they're all systemic, uh, bias the TRAG functions, while the, your target will be islet specific or is all specific for or homunculars or whatever antigens that TREC recognize? Yeah, so the general approach that many companies are taking, um, including others on this call, um, are really focused on targeting a uh, protein or peptide antigen present in the tissue that's being destroyed. And the reason for that is um, a combination, I think, of specific activity. Um, we've learned in a lot of animal models that, that cell Tregs that are specific for a particular antigen um, work uh, with many fewer cells um, and with much higher activity. Um, and to some extent, safety, um, that by targeting a particular antigen in a tissue, the off-target effects are likely to be um, less, and therefore there's the chance for systemic immunosuppression um, might be reduced. Uh, so I think that's the argument. I think one of the things that's really exciting about Treg therapy is this concept of infectious tolerance and, and bystander suppression, which, which translate, those are two kind of, you know, kind of key words for me, which is uh, for, for infectious tolerance, the idea that these cells will recruit other cells into the site that potentially have regulatory activity themselves. And so you get more bang for the buck at the site and a more generalized um, control and local regulation. And bystander suppression, meaning that although the cells may be specific for a single protein or antigen, that um, because of their polypharmaceutical activity, 
they actually suppress locally um, in, in uh, cells that see different specificities. So you get actually a broadening of the activity beyond the specificity of the cell. And that's a big advance for in, a big difference than for instance, a CAR T cell in cancer, where unless the tumor expresses the antigen, it's not gonna be killed. Um, so I think this gives us both specificity, selectivity, and enhanced um, functional activity in the local tissue, while, while I think uh, enhancing the safety signal and, um, and, and the off-target possibilities. Yeah. What can we say about the role of the gut, the human gut uh, microbiota in regulating Treg development? And, you know, obviously the type one diabetics come into the disease with microbiome dysregulation. So, you know, and there's definitely a role for the microbiome uh, interface with, at, with Tregs. So can you do anything there? Can you, can you work in from that route um, to, either uh, make sure that environment is, is perfectly suited for the Tregs you're delivering? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a really interesting field um, right now. I think there are sort of three areas where you can think about the microbiome. Uh, one is the metabolites that are being made by some of these um, bacteria, which seem to promote um, Tregs. Um, and, and I think that, you know, that's going to be a really important area to understand how the Tregs that we develop and and um, treat the patients with respond to those metabolites, and if we can enhance that um, interaction, that can be a, a, a real positive. Um, the short chain think, fatty acids. Yeah, butyrate, and yeah. Um, I think the second thing is actually there is evidence that Tregs can recognize some um, proteins expressed by um, bacteria, certain bacteria. Yeah. And so uh, one can even imagine, I'm not sure in diabetes, but perhaps in diseases like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, actually targeting um, bacteria um, directly with um, the Treg as a way to enhance local uh, regulation in that setting. And I think it'll be really interesting to see how that happens. And then the third is, is that um, the majority of cells that are, are considered regulatory T cells in the gut, um, some may argue whether my term majority is correct or not, but a lot of the cells that are present in there are actually generated in that site through what we call a, a, an induced um, um, peripherally derived. Um, so the repertoire of those cells is likely to be quite different than the repertoire of Tregs that are developed that emigrate from the thymus. And so maybe um, one might be able to take advantage of those cells in terms of their um, unique repertoire uh, in being able to shut down um, autoreactivity um, more effectively, either um, directly or in combination um, with other um, drugs. My, my concern about that population is that, at least in our hands, um, they seem to be uh, less stable and more likely to lose their FOXP3 expression. So companies like Genti um, and Marcus and others who are, are focusing on modulating the cells with, um, with various um, FOXP3 um, modifications could end up get, getting a quite stable population out of that, out of that cell population uh, as well. So I think there's um, a lot of opportunity there uh, and, and I think it'll be interesting to see I'll make one last kind of wacky thing, which people are doing. We've been doing some stuff with Michael Fish back on this at UCSF. And I say we, I had an old mentor, Frank Fitch, who used to say, whenever I say I, I mean we, and whenever I say we, I mean they. So now when I say we, I mean they. So the people at UCSF now are working with Michael to actually incorporate peptide antigens within the microbacterium so that actually you can actually use it as a delivery system for tolerogenic peptides, which I think could be a quite cool. Yeah, that's uh, very cool. I like that. I'm going to go dig into those, uh, into that uh, after this call and look, see what he's doing. Um, is there anyone else who's, who'd like to sort of, um, you know, ask a final question before we want to just respect your time here and thank you so much. Yes, yes. Um, so first of all, thanks for, for inviting me. So it's really interesting. Actually, I have an unrelated question, uh, Jeff. Uh, so um, is your company also looking uh, already into um, so some treatments for cardiovascular disease? 
I mean, it's widely ne neglected uh, yet in, let's say, classical immunology, but uh, I think there's also a great potential for direct transfer to treat uh, hypertension or atherosclerosis. Yeah, great, great question. Um, what we've said publicly um, is that we're very interested in um, what I would call non-classic immunological uh, settings of, um, of inflammation. Uh, certainly cardiovascular would fall in that bucket as do what we have talked about, certain neurological um, <laughs> neuroinflammatory conditions. Again, a plug for UCSF. We just treated our second pa COVID patient uh, with Tregs um, with the idea that we might be able to shut down some of the dysfunction. And you can imagine <clears throat> that if you could create an off-the-shelf Treg that 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 sort of you had ready to go, frozen down in the ER, that a lot of things, whether it be um, cardiovascular or stroke or ARDS, things where you need an immediate treatment that would shut down inflammation that's not an autoimmune disease that Tregs could be appropriate for that kind of um, activity. So I think there's a, there's a burgeoning opportunity here. And I think you mentioned one really interesting area um, for using Tregs beyond the immunological um, diseases that we've been focused on today. Interesting. Um, okay. Let's see, Yasmin, I'm sorry. I, ha I saw your hand and I didn't really see it down the bottom because I had to shut that down. So yes, please, uh, please ask your question. Oh, great. Thanks. Um, hi, Jeff. Um, just um, on the back of the bystander suppression and infectious tolerance comment that you made, um, do you think a multiple dosing approach will be necessary? Or do you think like a single dose of therapeutic Tregs could induce the state of tolerance? Yeah, so, I, you know, we, we all have our hopes, wishes, um, and certainly mine is uh, the one and done. What we do know is that the cells that we work with when I say we, I mean the UCSF, um, uh, are long-lived. We've seen these cells in the circulation at least a year out. So I think there's possible that we can have long-term um, uh, efficacy. Um, but I'll also point out an old study done by Herman Waldman now, over 20 years ago, showing that when he gave Tregs in an aloe transplant skin graft setting um, and waited three months and then got rid of the Tregs he injected, the animals didn't reject their graft. So in that setting where infectious tolerance was argued to mechanistically to be important, uh, you didn't need the cells to live forever. So, mm. you know, do I like the cells would live for a long time? Sure. Do I hope that they'll also bring other cells in that will, um, will enhance and maybe even replace the cells we put in over time? Sure. But if we have to do a treatment every couple of years, assuming we can freeze these cells down and have them readily available or even develop an off the shelf. Um, I think we have to be prepared for doing um, repeated treatments if that's what's necessary to maintain their uh, efficacy. How, um, how easy is it to freeze these cells down? Well, as I tell people in the lab all the time, it's really easy to freeze them. It's the thawing part that becomes <laughs> a little bit more challenging. So we freeze these cells down out now. Um, the answer is that um, there, there are now, I think, several companies, we're one of them, um, that have a protocol for cryopreservation that looks quite robust. And, and my expectation is that we are going to be working with a frozen product. That's cool. That's handy. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, this is a really interesting uh, new frontier that um, you guys are creating. And everyone, not just guys, um, is creating. And I think it's, um, I think it's really one to watch. I think it has a lot of places to add value. If you want to talk about the value prop, it, as, we, as we just discussed, it has a place in autoimmunity. It has a place potentially in, you know, high risk settings like the ER. And so um, I, I just really um, can't wait to see how this, uh, what the next steps are and, and what papers are coming out next, really. Thank you again, everyone, in, in, in just to conserve uh, everyone's time and to, and to be conscious of that. Um, thank you, uh, Jeff, for joining us. And it was just amazing, an excellent discussion. And uh, I look forward to seeing what's uh, coming from everyone's laboratory next. Have a great rest of your day, everyone.